So first, before I get into the meat of today's video, do not try this at home. Political plots require a high point. They require a watershed moment after which nothing is the same. There are three ways in which political plots can resolve. Rebellion, revolution or palace coup. Today, I want to talk about palace coups. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds. My name is Marie Mullaney. If this kind of content interests you, please do hit the subscribe button. I also do have a Discord server where you can connect with me and other world builders and you can request additional video topics. Okay, let's get cracking with palace coups. First, what is a palace coup? A palace coup is essentially the overthrow of the ruler, usually through non-violent means. This is your silent conspiracy where the leader and maybe one or two others are assassinated and a new leader is installed and the next morning, when people wake up, there's a new king on the throne, as if by magic. Why would there be a palace coup? The primary driving force of a palace coup is normally ambition. And this is one of the main forces that I'll analyze in my examples, including Kashil's Chosen, Robin Hobbs Farseer Trilogy, and Judith Tarr's Isle of Glass. But you can also have a coup as a form of self-defense where you are replacing the leader before they can chop your head off. I think that this was one of the driving forces behind Cersei's palace coup in A Song of Ice and Fire in the first book Game of Thrones, which will also be an example that I will be looking into. Then your last two reasons are basically one reason which is you're replacing a bad ruler or you're doing it out of genuine principles. So replacing a bad ruler would be like Catherine the Great from our world. Her husband, Peter, was genuinely not suited for the throne of Russia. You could also argue that Cersei was in a way doing this because Robert was so unsuited for the Iron Throne that his rule was close to a disaster. And then lastly, you could be replacing a ruler out of principle, as was the case when Brutus and his conspirators murdered Caesar, which we will also discuss as an example of palace coups. So let's take a look at these examples and see what we can learn about them in how to construct effective palace coups that either succeed or fail as your plot requires. I'd like to start at the bottom with Caesar's murder by Brutus and the conspirators of the Senate. It is a good example of a partially succeeded, partially failed coup. On the one hand, they did kill Caesar, so they did remove the leader. But the coup itself, I would count as a failure, because instead of replacing Caesar with what they wanted, which is a return to Senate rule, what happened was it kicked off a war that ultimately killed the Republic and resulted in the birth of the Empire, which is basically what Caesar was, right? He was the first dictator for life. The reason that this coup failed was because they didn't have a leader ready to take over when Caesar was murdered. The coup immediately fell to infighting amongst each other. Mark Antony escaped, creating a loose end situation. And ultimately, they entered war. And he won. Mark Antony won and the empire was born. I think the biggest lesson from a palace coup perspective that one should take from that failed coup is that it's all very well to kill the leader. That's step one. But if you don't have step two ready, if you don't know what's going to take the leader's place and that step isn't solid, your coup will fail and result in chaos and nature abhorring a vacuum will find and insert a leader not necessarily of your choosing. So if you want a successful palace coup, you need to have a leader ready and willing to step into the gap once the old leader is dead. That leader also needs to have commitment 
man needs to be ready to think on their feet. And that brings me to my second historical example, which is that of Catherine the Great of Russia. Now, the interesting thing about Catherine the Great is that she wasn't Russian. She was a Germanic princess called Princess Sophie, who was actually rebaptized as Catherine. But her husband, Peter, who she was brought to marry, who was actually the heir to the throne, was completely unsuited for the Russian throne. And all he wanted to do was suck up to the Prussian emperor. Catherine, on the other hand, rapidly became the darling of the Russian court. And when Peter's mother died and Peter ascended to the throne, it became manifestly clear that he was not well suited to the throne and that his wife would make a much better emperor. When the conspirators felt Catherine out about this, she indicated that she would not be averse to something happening. Their conspiracy was discovered, however, and here the brilliance of Catherine really shines because instead of letting the conspiracy fall apart or begging for Peter's forgiveness or fleeing, she donned armor, mounted a horse, got the conspirators' military forces behind her, rode through the streets of St. Petersburg and arrested her husband. The conspiracy fell apart around her, and yet she didn't let that stop her. She just bulldozed through the coup using a new plan adjusting from the old one. This is a prime example of a leader driving a coup to a successful conclusion even when it starts to fall apart around them. So if you want to tell the story of the actual coup, have bad things happen. If you want the coup to succeed, just make sure that your leader has the charisma and the chutzpah to drive the matter forward even when everything is falling apart around them. Okay, so those were two historical examples, but what about some fantasy examples? Now, I do need to issue a warning here. Every single book that I'm going to discuss, I am going to spoil. You can't talk about a palace coup in a fantasy novel and not spoil the plot. So if you intend to read any of these books, I will give a few seconds warning each time, and you can use the chapters down below in the description to skip over the specific books that you don't want to have spoiled. First, let's talk about Kashil's Chosen by Jacqueline Carey. If you do not want to have this spoiled, skip ahead now. So the bare bones of the plot is that the villain, Melisande, has married the queen's uncle, Benedict, and she has conceived a child with him, a pure blood heir. The queen is coming on a royal progress to visit her uncle. And the plot is that the queen, Yassandra, will be assassinated and then Benedict will take her place. The assassination of the queen is foiled by Phaedra, the main heroine of the story. But, as Melisande says, when this is successfully foiled and she is actually arrested and the queen's uncle Benedict is killed, she says, I am not finished. She sends word to Terra de Ange, to her co-conspirators there, that the queen is dead, even though the queen is not dead. And the reason why she does this is because it creates a situation of misinformation. Her co-conspirators back in Terra de Ange can call the queen an imposter, and because one of her co-conspirators is the commander of the armies, he can literally attack the queen with the full force of her own nation. So this use of misinformation is incredibly intelligent. Sometimes you don't even have to kill the person. You just have to have everybody else think they're dead. What's very interesting here is that this misinformation is in part countered by using coins that have been stamped with Yassandra's profile. And if you want to learn more about my take on fantasy currencies, building them and using them in your plot, you can check out my video on fantasy currencies right over there. So that is Kashil's Chosen, from which we learn how to use misinformation in plotting a coup. 
Next, I'm going to talk about Judith Tarr's Isle of Glass. Skip ahead now to avoid spoilers. Isle of Glass is historical fantasy, set in England during the reign of Richard the Lionheart. The pronunciation of some of these names are Welsh. I'm trying to get them right, but English isn't my first language and I've never even heard Welsh. So if I get them wrong, please do forgive me. In the Isle of Glass, the main villain is Ruthreg, and he puts in place a plot to get three kingdoms, England, Gwyneth, and the fantasy kingdom of Rayana at war. His plan is to see three kings involved in the war and hopefully dead on the battlefield, and then potentially seize the crown. His plot is ultimately undone because our main hero, Ulf, who is what I would describe as a she-fay, foresees what he's doing in a prophecy and manages to first delay Richard in his march on Gwyneth and finally convince him to make peace rather than war. It is a great book which I highly recommend. But what do we learn from this book in terms of planning a palace coup? Firstly, magic can be a great addition to countering of a coup if used judicially. Ulf can see the vision of what would happen but Richard doesn't want to believe him, so convincing the king is a large part of the story. Secondly, manipulating external politics into your coup can create a fantastic diversion, allowing you to strike while everyone is looking the wrong way. Now, Rithric did fail, but that's hardly his fault. He was, after all, a man playing against the Fae, hardly a fair fight. So from Judith Tarr, we've learned how to use external politics to create internal strife that allows a coup to take place. Let's turn our attention to Cersei from A Game of Thrones. Oops, forgot the spoiler warning. If you don't want Game of Thrones, the book and the TV series season one spoiled for you, skip this chapter and on to the next in the description. So what Cersei did was remarkably intelligent. She didn't actually poison her husband. She just ensured that he was in no state to go on a hunt and then let a wild boar take care of the rest. Boars are very dangerous. And if you control what the king is eating and drinking, you put it into a situation where it's very, very easy to make it look like a complete accident that he died. But what's more interesting to me in the whole Cersei plot is how rapidly she moved afterwards to eliminate the scent. And this is important. Even if your coup is successful in killing the main target, the leader, and even if you can then get your leader on the throne, in this case, her son, you can still have the scent. And that the scent can either poison your rule or result in a counter coup which can result in the ultimate failure of your coup attempt. Cersei moved with enormous speed to counteract this in arresting Ned. Ned was the immediate descent, the counterpoint to her narrative that the king was dead and the king's son was taking over. And she moved fast as lightning, had him arrested, and ultimately he was killed. The lesson from Cersei's coup is... The moment you hear a voice of dissent, move swiftly and ruthlessly to silence that voice. Finally, I can't talk about coups and not talk about Robin Hobb's Farseer trilogy. If you have not read the Farseer trilogy and you don't want it spoiled, skip ahead now. I'm going to be talking about all three books. Okay, here we go. In book one, we are introduced to fit chivalry and regal. For the purpose of this video, all we really need to know is that regal is the ambitious younger prince to his brother Verity, who is the rightful king-in-waiting, or crown prince if you prefer, and Fitz is a royal bastard, trained as an assassin, who is also a mage wielding the forbidden magic of wit. In book two, Royal Assassin, Verity, who's basically running the kingdom because the king is ill, decides to leave Buckkeep to try and gain the help of the legendary elderlings with the kingdom's Red Reaver problem. 
The red reavers are only important to us in this video because they provide an external conflict that allows the internal strife to grow. Many folks see Verity's quest as a fool's errand, and it leaves Regal free to work his plots more easily. Fitz and Verity's queen, Ketrikin, leave to quell a raider attack on one of the coastal duchies, and while they are gone, Regal makes his move. He says that word has come that Verity is dead and makes himself king-in-waiting in Verity's place. You see how once again misinformation plays a role? Fitz ends up using magic to determine that Verity is still alive, but like Ulf in the Isle of Glass, he can't do much with this information. He ends up captured by Regal and tortured, and, well, the book doesn't end very well. Regal has apparently pulled off a successful coup. But Verity is still alive, and this is the big problem with using misinformation. The truth is out there, and it can come back to bite you. There is a saying in my world of the hidden blade. Ghosts are nothing but the phantoms of an ill-disciplined mind. But loose ends will come back to haunt you. And that would prove to be the case in book three of the Farseer trilogy. And before we get into that, there's a quick plug. The Hidden Blade, Sunwheel Chronicles book one, is available to pre-order now and releases on 10 September 2021. Okay, let's get back to Robin Hobb. In the final book, there's a lot of activity dealing with the Red Reavers, which I'm not going to cover here. It's not central to the politics, but it is very cool, and I highly recommend reading the books. It involves dragons and pirates. I mean, what's not to love? Anyway, as part of all the fun and games, Regal's coterie of magic users are broken, and that leaves him open to Fitz's magic. Fitz breaks his mind and makes him fanatically loyal to the people of the six duchies and to Ketterkin, Verity's wife and the mother of his heir. I should probably add that Verity himself has turned into a dragon at this point. Again, very cool, but not really central to the politics. There's a lot going on in these books. Anyway, point is, Fitz uses magic along with the truth of Verity still being out there, albeit in dragon form, to successfully counter-coup. Because the Farseer books are definitely the feel-good books of the century, Fitz then has to leave the Six Duchies, leaving his own daughter behind to keep her safe from his enemies. These books provide a great example of everything we have learned so far about palace coups. So, what have we learned about palace coups besides please don't try them at home? Make sure you have a leader who is ready to take over. Make sure that you have the ability to move fast and to adjust to changing plans. Make sure that you have secrecy around your methods. Remember, the chance of a secret getting out is equal to the square of the people who know it. The less people in on the conspiracy, the better your chance of success. And finally, do not leave loose ends. Loose ends will kill you. Coups are watershed events. Nothing is the same after they've happened. So if you do have a coup and it is a failure, remember, the guys who were involved in the coup don't just come back from that. They'll end up dead or at best exiled or in jail. And if you have a coup that is successful, the same applies. Your leader is probably dead or exiled at best and your conspirators are now in charge of the country and have to deal with that. It is a massive climax, and after it, everything should be different. Finally, do not forget about magic. Loki in the Avengers is a great example of having a coup without actually replacing the leader as he takes Odin's place. You can also use magic to spread disinformation or otherwise assassinate the leader. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode on political watersheds, specifically the palace coup. My name is Marie Mullaney. You can support me by buying me coffee on ko-fi.com or by buying my book, which is available on pre-order on Amazon, link down below. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you did enjoy this.